Good morning. Welcome to our Palm Sunday service. We will be distributing palms between 9 and 11 a.m. on April 5th. It is going to be a drive through event. There will be no need for you to get out of your car. Um, we will also be um, celebrating the uh, communion. So uh, again, those are individually wrapped and sealed um, elements. So again, they will not have been touched by us in any way, shape, or form. And hopefully you'll find that comforting. Our Easter service should be very exciting. We are going to uh, live stream our sunrise service. Uh, again, we'll be holding that at 6 a.m. Um, and if you want to join us via Facebook, you're welcome to join us. Also, our 10 o'clock Easter service, again, should be uh, interesting and um, something worth celebrating uh, that we can manage to somehow be together yet maintain the necessary distance to keep each other safe. Our 10 o'clock service will be held in the parking lot behind the church. You'll be able to stay in the comfort of your own car. Uh, the audio, the sound will be streamed on an FM station. I believe it is 89.1. It will actually, the service will be very much like a drive-in movie for all of you that remember what that is. So please know that all are welcome. We have lit our celebration candle in support of all those people putting themselves in harm's way to protect us. And may we respond in kind to protect them. Let us remember to wear our gloves and masks and whatever you feel is really comfortable for you to do. And if that means stay at home, please stay at home. That's where you should be anyway. The Lord be with you. For this morning's passing of the peace, I ask that you think of someone and let that someone be anyone, the first person that pops to your mind. Maybe that's, maybe that's someone who angered you or upset you or maybe it's your grandbaby or children or spouse. But think of someone and think about Christ in them. A prayer of confession. Holy God, we have blamed you when the hosannas die and the parade turns into a mob scene. We heap our doubts on you even though it is our inaction that adds power to those who shout, crucify him. We rebel against the risks of discipleship. Why raise our voices against the evil we see? One voice simply becomes one more victim. O oh God, we protest, but we know down deep that the victim of our silence is the way of love, the way of life. Forgive our cowardice and help us to stand with Christ in a world that has forgotten humility and obedience to you. O oh God, we want to be faithful. Hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Children of the Most Holy, God does not forsake us. In times of terror and suffering, we are not alone. In Christ, we are strengthened as we watch and pray. We receive courage to love in the face of ridicule and to act for truth amid the oppressive forces of deceit. Love is at the heart of creation, bringing us new beginnings and the resurrection of life in its fullness. Everything will be alright. Everything will be alright. After the storm cloud passes, In today's reading, we hear about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on a colt. According to the book of Numbers, an animal to be used for certain sacred purposes must be chosen from those that have never been used for ordinary labor. A colt can be a horse or a donkey, but Matthew and John specify a donkey, thus fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious. Is he humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? A donkey is a humble mount, and the colt of a donkey even more so. Donkeys are smaller than horses. They are not as fast or responsive as a horse. The colt of a donkey could barely carry a full-grown man. Kings ride neither colts nor donkeys, but full-grown horses, well-trained, responsive horses, horses chosen in part for strength and spirit and in part for appearance. Beautiful horses, large, impressive mounts, the size and beauty of the king's horse bear testimony to the king's importance. Jesus is king of the Jews, but he is a different kind of king, the kind of king who rides a donkey colt, comes in peace, comes to serve, comes to die. Just as a king's huge spirited war horse sends a message about the man who rides it, so also Jesus' donkey colt sends a message about him, who he is, his purpose in coming. This morning's reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. There Jesus sent two of the disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied up with her colt beside her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything, tell them the master needs them, and then he will let them go at once. This happened in order to make come true 
what the prophet had said. Tell the city of Zion, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble and rides on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did what Jesus had told them to do. They brought the donkey and the colt, threw their cloaks over them, and Jesus got on. A large crowd of people spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds walking in front of Jesus and those walking behind began to shout, Praise to David's son. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise be to God. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Who is he? The people asked. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee, the crowds answered. This ends our reading from the book of Matthew. <clears throat> in this reading, we're going to hear just how much Jesus is like us and also how unlike many of us he truly is. We learn in this reading Jesus knows he has less than a week to live. He has known for some time now that he was going to die, but now it's coming down to the wire. I don't know how you would react to such news, but I've talked with friends who said as long as they were healthy, they were going to take out all the stops. They were going to live it up. They were going to party hardy. Other people I talked to spoke of spending quality time with family and friends. And I think that's kind of wise. One thing I've learned is that as I get older, I am less about doing extreme things and more content with experiencing meaningful things. How about you? How would you spend your last week on earth? Jesus knows he has to go to Jerusalem because it is there that he will freely give of himself for all humankind. He will die on the cross. But first, there are preparations to be made. He sends two disciples ahead of him with the instructions that they are to bring back a donkey and her colt. His actions will not be lost on the people gathered to meet him. They will remember the words of the prophet, Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king comes to you. He is righteous and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. And while, yes, Jesus is presenting himself as king, his kingship isn't about pomp and circumstance. While Jesus is king, he is, however, unlike any king that came before him, or any king since. Could Jesus boast? Sure, why not? He is, after all, God's son. But the Apostle Paul puts the true character of Jesus into perspective in his letter to the Philippians. He says, though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality to God anything to be held on to. But he emptied himself. So this is one way Jesus differs from many of us. Jesus was not hung up on power, notoriety, or glory. It's not all about him. He does not come as a conqueror sitting high and mighty upon a noble steed. He is not lavished in jewels and finery. He is not one to be seated on a throne made of gold. Instead, he comes as a regular kind of guy, sitting astride a colt. Jesus enters the gate with all humility. He is a living example to all those watching him. He is the true definition of a leader. He is showing that a leader does not have to be intimidating or arrogant. A king doesn't need to place himself above his subjects. Through his actions, he is showing all of his disciples. His disciples are you and I, as well as those that were with him. 
that his leadership is not to be one of domination, of authority or power, but of servanthood and humility. In today's world, being a servant or being humble doesn't get you very far. If we were honest with ourselves and with each other, we'd have to admit that we're impressed with grand things, big cars, big boats, airplanes, Herculean tasks are what impress us. If we really thought about it, Jesus didn't do what he did to impress us. Again, he's God's son. He doesn't need to impress anybody. What Jesus is telling us is that leadership doesn't come from the biggest, the baddest, or even the strongest. He's saying that leadership comes from humility, from caring for all God's creation, especially those considered by many to be the least of these. He is, as we should be too, a living example for everyone to see. He proves this time and again. Jesus is strong, yes, but not in the way that impresses us. He is a servant. He washes the feet of his disciples. He forgives. He teaches. He puts the needs of others ahead of his own and is willing to sacrifice himself so that others may find their pathway to God. Unfortunately, today, 2,000 years later, many Christians are missing out on what humility and servanthood in the eyes of God really means. When we all practice the art of loving one another as ourselves, we will be working towards a world where no one is left to fend for themselves. People who identify as Christians have heard over and over again throughout the centuries how God wants us to live our lives. They have heard and often ignored the two most important commandments, that we love God with our whole being and love our neighbor as ourselves. But sadly, for some reason or another, the majority of Christians cannot buy into these commands. Maybe it is because of our false sense of independence, our belief that everyone has equal opportunities and that people should lift themselves up out of depressed states by their own bootstraps. When we all practice the art of loving one another as ourselves, we will be working towards a world where no one is left to fend for themselves. There is no one, no one that can make it through life solely on their own skills and knowledge. This pandemic we are facing is a wake-up call to all those who think they don't need help from anyone. We can't go it alone. We need the doctor, nurse, patient care tech, the truck driver, the stock clerk, trash collector, scientist. If there is one thing we have learned for sure is that a high salary or college education does not protect anyone from the virus. No one is above the laws of mortality. We have been called over and over and over again to put the needs of others right up there and equal to the needs of ourselves. But this doesn't happen. We live lives of I want, I want, and I want, while we turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to those who live desperate lives of I need. We are all on this planet together. One change I am praying for in light of this pandemic is a recognition that every human life counts. Nobody is less than anybody else. When this is all over, will we wake up to the fact that all life is sacred? We will learn one way or another, we all have to pay the piper. It is a sad state of affair that it takes a global pandemic for us to see the worth of our neighbor. People are now waking up to the fact that we are all inextricably linked. That even though we feel we can be an island unto ourselves, there really is just an insignificant amount of actual separation between us. No one is really completely cut off from the tentacles of this illness. The risk facing the world is like no other. 
how we handle these huge obstacles will be a testament to what we have learned through our faith and from our neighbors. If we really listen to the voice of God, we can come out of this time with a greater appreciation of all who sojourn on the spinning ball of life we call the earth. This is God's creation. We are God's creation. May we learn to honor and cherish the gift of our planet and each other. Amen. As we prepare to come together in prayer, let us take a moment to remember those in our lives, the people in our church that are being isolated and left alone. May we remember those that may have cognitive issues and can't understand why no one's coming to see them anymore. Let us pray for each other. Let us come together in a spirit of prayer. God of unfailing love, we come before you on this day with thankful and joyous hearts because your love knows no bounds. No boundaries, limits, or obstacles, including those of our own making, can prevent your loving kindness from following us all the days of our lives. Yet during this week, your story of passion mirrors to us how we have tested your love and spurned your compassion. We find no abiding place in those who welcome you in God's name during this week. You are welcomed with short lived lives. We kneel before you in awe of the mystery of your faithfulness. We kneel before you with confession, acknowledging our complicity with friends and enemies alike who through the ages have disowned you through our words and actions. We kneel before you in gratitude, forever thankful that even during Passion Week, your love held strong. As we enter into Holy Week, brace us with fortitude and gratitude and with the assurance that you are with us, world without end. Lord, even as we come to you in the most holiest of days, we ask for your presence among us. Hear the silent prayers of our hearts and minds. God of grace and compassion, as we await the outcome of this pandemic, may we not react in fear. Fear just breeds all negative. Let us find your shalom instead. Let us find your peace. Though it may not be a peace that offers us complete safety and protection. May your peace enter our hearts and may that be what flows through us and into the way we decide how to treat our brothers and sisters in this time. We ask these things through your Holy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I feel the intangible I see the invisible The sky is the limit to what I can have The sky is the limit to what I can have Hey
perform it today. like to offer a blessing of the palms. O oh God, who in Jesus Christ triumphantly entered Jerusalem, heralding a week of pain and sorrow, be with us now as we follow the way of the cross. In these events of defeat and victory, you have sealed the closeness of death, of humiliation and exaltation. We thank you for these branches that promise to become for us symbols of martyrdom and majesty. Bless them and us that their use this day may announce in our time that Christ has come and that Christ will come again. Amen. Come Christ Jesus. We celebrate an open communion table to which everyone who is seeking God's grace is welcome. One need not be a member of our church family or any community of faith to partake of the gifts of the table. We believe that Christ extends the invitation and that Christ welcomes all. O oh Lord, my God, you lovingly invite us to this table of blessings of hope and grace, healing and peace. You welcome us and feed us with the bread from heaven and the cup of life. In your great love and mercy, you share with us your own life in Jesus Christ. Let your spirit flow through our hearts. Your strength be our strength, your will be our will, your love be our love, and your grace be our grace. As we now come to this table, bless this bread from heaven and bless this cup of life that we may be one with you in heart, mind, and will. Amen. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed by one of his own, he sat at a table with all his disciples and over the course of the meal, he took the bread. As was the custom, he blessed it. He gave thanks for it, and then he broke it. Then he gave it to his disciples and said to them, This is my body broken for you. As often as you break bread, do so in remembrance of me. And so ministering to you in his name, we give you this bread. Again on that same night, Jesus took a cup up off the table. As was the custom, he blessed it. He gave thanks for it. And then he handed it to his disciples and said to them, This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many in the forgiveness of sins. Truly I say unto you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. And so ministering to you in his name, we give you this cup. This is the body and blood of Christ shed for all of us in the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat.
Gracious God, we thank you that in this sacrament, you assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and help us to grow in love and obedience that we may serve you in the world and finally be brought to that table where all your saints feast with you forever. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit to live and work for your praise and glory. Amen. As we continue our time of self-isolation, of reflection, of renewal, as we look at the upcoming week, that may we understand the purpose of Christ's sacrifice for us. His service was for us. His being was for us. May we, in turn, be a blessing to others in his name. We pray. Amen.